Good evening, everybody. Ooh, that's loud. <laughs> Such a small room. <laughs> My name is Vanessa September. I'm the CEO of the Constitution Hill Trust. It's a real pleasure and a delight to welcome you to this We the People conversation. Uh, we um, have some very special guests in the room with us, um, including some of our board members and the board members of the Constitution Hill Development Company, with whom we're a keen partner and a co-host of this event, along with the Flame Studio. Thank you, Lance, for your generosity of the space, which is a lovely space. And um, it's, uh, it's the second one this year. We, we would like to have some more, but I think that tonight is different. The first one was all about the Constitution and um, whether it's a doorway to freedom or a barrier to change. But tonight we're going to look at the cultural aspects of the people who were involved with our um, fight for democracy in a different way. And since it's Women's Month, we have invited Ma Barbara Masakela and Msaki. And Luanda Tkaso, my colleague, is going to introduce the theme for the evening and, uh, and introduce the, the speakers. So welcome and enjoy. And when we're finished, please join us for some more, some more snacks and drinks and conversation. Luanda? Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Uh, my job this evening is to set the scene and to just share the thinking behind the theme a little bit. For those who don't know, the theme is art and justice and joy and struggle. And uh, please indulge me because when I prepared my remarks, I kind of got carried away because art and justice, those are my favorite themes and they are so well embodied by Constitution Hill. We know that the legal system under apartheid was an instrument of oppression. And with the advent of our constitutional <coughs> democracy, trust in the justice system wasn't going to magically manifest just because we had a new constitution. It had to be earned. So when the judges of the court were building this new institution, the question that they had for the architects and the designers is how do we put a smiling face onto the justice system? One of the ways in which this was achieved was through art. Art has a long history here at Constitution Hill, even when the site operated as a prison. In an exhibition titled Resistance and Resilience in the Number Four Prison, we hear the stories of how the former prisoners used singing and creativity to humanize a place that was built to kill them. The use of art by the court is a continuation of that long tradition of using art and creativity to hearten once heartless institutions. So the constitutional court's work may be about justice, but it is founded on art. That convergence of art and justice on the site is the legacy of struggle icons such as Fatima Mir, who was able to cultivate beauty in one of the most brutal environments. And that beauty is embodied by her drawings which she produced while she was incarcerated. Fatima Mir was a prisoner here at the women's jail who used art as a humanizing tool. In 1976, she was held for six months without trial under the apartheid government's terrorism act her crime was an attempt to organize a mass rally with the activist Utatu Steve Biko after the police shot and killed student protesters in Soweto. She was detained with other women activists, including Mama Winnie Mandela, who with the help of her lawyer ultimately smuggled Fatima Mia's drawings out of the prison. And the work remains the only visual record of life in the jail from that period. The justice in Fatima Mia's art is in highlighting the incarcerated women's moments of solidarity. As a community, and this was very significant in a prison and a world that divided women by color. And she also depicted, the other part of our theme tonight, she depicted in her art the individual <coughs> joy the incarcerated woman found in ordinary moments. Guided by the captions to her drawings, we learn of these women's daily routines. Empty the bucket, brush teeth, exercise, have breakfast, scrub cells, do laundry, lunch at 
lock up between 12 and 1.30 or maybe 2 p.m. In her work, we see Miss Jeannie Noel playing cards with Sbongile Kubega. We see Sally Montlana musing behind her newspaper. We see Cecily Palmer, pensive, and Vesta Smith playing spill and spell. Guess with who? With my choice. My choice, what is spill and spell? Oh, there you go. <laughs> and Beauty, who was convicted and sentenced to hard labor for incitement during Harry Kissinger's visit to South Africa, cleans the walls. In some of her artwork, Mia defies the state of being banned. The artwork called The Card Players. There are a number of detained women along with a warden who sit in a circle playing cards. And a caption on another drawing where a wardress, Cecilia, is playing a game of spill and spell with Edith Bandler, a prisoner awaiting trial. And Fatima Mia takes delight in a simple fact that this gathering was about breaking the rules. And whereas justice is used to enforce just rules, policies, and laws, art is an opportunity to break the rules of conformity, of the uninspiring, the dull, the outdated, and the, the unquestioned. Art is usually said to be in the domain of the heart and justice is in the domain of the brain. But I, think it is but I think it is mostly women who understand that these two cannot be separated. One enhances the other. What is the value of justice with no art and what is the value of art with no justice? <clears throat> Tonight's conversation is to ponder on the theme and whether finding joy and struggle is possible. It's to commemorate Women's Month. And this time around, we didn't only want to focus on the injustices that are wrought on women on a daily basis in South Africa, but we also want to highlight that it is women who are light bearers, who are the lights on the hill. And we are doing so here at Constitution Hill, the home of the Constitutional Court, which in the words of Albie Sachs and Edwin Cameron, my teachers, show how art and human rights overlap and reinforce each other. They also say that at the core of the Bill of Rights and of the artistic endeavor represented in the court is the respect for human dignity. And in between art and justice, what holds those two themes together is human dignity. And this theme will be illuminated by our panelists, uh, Uma Barbara Masekela and Msaki. I met my Barbara at uh, Cheryl's house at a get together and I was tasked with driving her home and I absolutely loved her style. She's like my style icon, as you could tell. And uh, she cooks really well, and I'm still, uh, we talk about the food that she cooks really well. She hasn't made it for me, but I'm hoping when she's done with her second book, we will celebrate over some fish. And um, I mean, she has a long storied career. She was the head of the ANC's department, Department of Art and Culture. She was an ambassador to the US. She's a writer, she's a poet, she's an educator, and she's just an incredibly amazing woman that I'm so grateful to have in my life. And Msaki, I met Msaki at Con Hill. She frequents uh, Flame Studios and sometimes we have brief conversations. And I felt that she embodies the artist that we want to define the space, uh, Flame Studios, this rehearsal room. She told me the other day that she was studying to be a lawyer, inspired by her father. And uh, she fell in love with visual arts and she dropped out of law and she feels like, I couldn't have been a lawyer. But I'm like, that's the purpose of tonight. It's the fact that these two things can live together and I think in you is that activist, that lawyer. Um, she did visual arts, she studied um, in England where she taught herself to play the guitar and she also studied music in North Carolina and she started her own label called One Shushu Day and I love the name for the label and she has released two award-winning albums. So with that, I'm going to hand over to our beautiful panelists. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, um, firstly, just to be in this room with such incredible 
light bearers, as as Londo has said. Um, I mean, the thing about being a law school dropout, it's not a, a, a very unique story for musicians. I think it's a bit tired. But interestingly enough, um, my favorite law subject was constitutional law. And I had a constitution that my dad gave me that I used to underline things in a, a red color pencil. And I remember being struck by the ideals of this book, even the poetry, actually. And, and the fact that there was like an intentional, you know, Im, Im, embracing of art, even in the book and the way that it's, it's made. Um, and I think, I don't believe in coincidences. I mean, I'm here sitting with an amazing writer and activist and a person who has a story in the struggle of this country. And mine is to listen because we don't really get a chance to hear from your generation that has actually lived through these things enough. We are now in a space where we're tired, you know? People are tired of, of, um, of hearing stories of struggle. And I'll say tired because I remember when I was an art student, I would get, I was the only black girl in my class and I would get lower marks if I didn't perform my struggle and my blackness and my pain. And I said, what if I wanna just paint a pool on a Sunday afternoon? with some flowers and a butterfly. Why is that profound when Lindsay does it? And not profound when I do it. I'm supposed to be passing here for, for an A. And I remember the fatigue of struggle, just with young people. And I think there's, a, there's a, an energy where we're missing out on stories because of this fatigue and the story being overtold and not told right by the people that actually lived through it, that are not, you know, that are jaded, but at the same time, you, your perspective is something that I think we don't get to hear enough of. And so, you know, in, 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 in saying that I'm accepting my, my life as a failed lawyer and as an artist, I'm also just saying that these are the stories that keep us going and that make sense, you know. So I, I would just love to let the people and also be <laughs> sitting at your feet just to hear yeah. from you. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, and to be with all of you, many of whom I know quite well, and I've struggled with, together with. Um, you know, for me, the overwhelming thing uh, is that um, I think that beauty, beauty is an important thing, and it is not something for rich people, for educated people, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It, <coughs> it is something that belongs to all of us. And as I look at South African society today, I think that one of the things that we have really failed in is to try and provide the opportunity for the majority of our people to have a glimpse into beauty. Just to have a glimpse into it. I'm talking here about the Val River. I'm talking about sewerage in the streets. I'm talking about dirt in our streets all over the country. I'm talking about people queuing at hospitals. I'm talking about children, um, you know, enjoying fights at school and taking, you know, pictures of fights. I'm talking about ugliness. We have created a lot of ugliness in South Africa. And... Um, so, as we talk about art, I, 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 I want to say that art is not only in the created thing. It, it is not only something that belongs to people who are creative, but that you can make beauty in the everyday lives of people, that it is possible to do so and for, for people to have uh, an intimation 
of beauty in their lives. When we were growing up, there were people who lived emasageni, which is in the squatter camps. And my mother was a social worker. And I would just be fascinated by the fact that she was so intrigued by the visits that she had to the people who lived in the squatter camps because in their, in their squats, they would create beauty for themselves with newspaper cuttings, with cuttings from magazines like Drum and so on. They would have them pasted all over with the, with the uh, labels of tin food. They would carefully take out the label and plaster it on the walls. Uh, um, so that when I look at some of the modern art, for instance, like I'm trying to remember the name of the famous man, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol, for instance, you know. I mean, that was done by these people. They did it where they lived. They created beauty for themselves. So, um, to me, that is art as well, you know, because when I think of art in general terms, I think of something that is also got, has got its own apartheid. You know, it's, 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 it's about people who know about art, who can afford art, who can afford to go and look at art, who can afford to buy it. You know, and this is the preserve of a few people. So that is what is so wonderful, for instance, about the art at the Constitutional Court, that it is accessible and available to everybody, you know, if they can get there. And for often for most of us, of, 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 of the majority of the people, for them to go and see art, they have to move from where they live and go to the market theater to look at a, a, a play. They have to go to a museum, you know, to go and look at things. But these things are not within their own surroundings, you know. They are not accessible. And as far as, as, as I can see, when, when we talk about the Constitution, I mean, it's just daylight robbery of, 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 of beauty, you know, because it is, it says that people have a right to this. But yet, we have not in our, in, in our efforts to transform, we have not taken into account those people. Earlier on, I was talking to, to Albi, who is an old comrade, literally <laughs> and figuratively, <laughs> an old comrade and friend. And I was saying to him, I, I, I was saying to him that, um, you know, I think of a 10 year old child coming from school and going home to an empty house where there's nobody, and maybe where there's no ceiling or where there's no electric lights. I'm thinking, if something happened to this child, you know, maybe the parents are at work, they are going to come back late because they have to stand in a long queue you know, to get into a bus which takes maybe a third of the money that they have worked for for that day, you know. Um, this is something that was happening when I was growing up, but should it really be happening now? Can we really sit here and say that it's okay for it to be happening, for that little girl or that little boy to be raped and, and have nobody? to say, something has happened to me. 
and uh, to wait for tired parents who come from work. You know, maybe they, maybe they are drunk. Maybe they are just tired. They've just had a bad day. So for me, uh, I can talk about art only at a time when we will have decided among ourselves, for instance, what are the minimum facilities that you need for a certain number of people in a township? I think that is the, the scientific approach we should have, that uh, there should be the minimum, you know, and that we should fight towards that. Um, on the other hand, I also think that we need to have a serious busing program. As long as we do not have these facilities now, we should have a way of bringing the people to the art if it is not with them. One of the things I'd like to ask you, Msaki, I'll take advantage of you because you're here, um, is that I often think about it. I get very impatient with young people because they're satisfied with, with, their, you know, with their phones and all the information that they get out of the phone and so on, you know, that they get instantly, you know. Uh, uh, when, when I was at university, when you went to the library to read a reference book, most of the time it was out and you had to book it you know, because that person would bring it back in three or four days or in if they were selfish in a week, you know. So you had to wait for that book that you shared with so many people and finally you would get it into your hands. But it would lead you to other books, you know, and you would read beyond, far beyond that book. And I see... You know, I heard you, I heard you, and I understand that young people are tired of listening to all these grand stories about great people who had great character, you know. Um, but in a way, my book was about older people. It, it's mostly about my grandmother because... I realized that she never had a voice to tell me what happened to her, that she was a little girl during the South African War, which we call the Anglo-Boer War, that she would tell me stories about seeing white men slashing meat from cows or, you know, animals, <laughs> Uh, that she would, they would be watching from the bush. They would come out of the kitchen where they worked. She was only about 10, 11, 12, and watch these white people coming in their, you know, in, in their um, wagons and so on. And that they would send the little children to the kitchen door to ask for food. And in my childish brain. I could not imagine a white person coming to beg for food at the kitchen and being given that food by a black servant who was eating well. And I began to wonder about her life. I began to wonder about what kind of life. And really my book is about that. It's trying to put myself into the body of my grandmother and trying to imagine what was it like for a black woman in the early 19th century and the late 18th century. Because I think that sometimes we are so seized with the suffering that we endured during apartheid that we cannot see beyond that. We can only see ourselves as the people who have suffered most. And in that way, we throw our, away our heritage <coughs> and we throw away our history because we cannot 
imagine ourselves in our grandparents. And I'm talking as an 80-year-old, you know, 81-year-old, you know. So um, th those are just some of the thoughts that come out up to me as I think about art and justice, because I was raised by this woman. God knows what had happened to her. We don't know. We don't know. I read about GBV every day, but I know that I lived GBV in Alexandra Township every day. It is not a new thing. You know, and by that, I'm not saying it's less painful or more painful. I'm just saying that we tend to be seized by our own suffering and pain. And um, this is where we also need art, you know, to bring out, you know, uh, uh, the, the greater dimension of life to us. I mean, this is what you're doing. This is bringing forth your grandmother's story through a work of art mm -hmm. is also allowing us to perceive a different age and perspective. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's so many things that you said, Mama Brother, that I wanted to speak to. I love your idea of seeing, you know, beauty as justice, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a song. Is it, I want to sing your song because I have a, a line um, in a song okay. where I kind of hint to that sentiment but you know when you're talking about how people are living mm -hmm. and that there's this constitution with these beautiful words and the the reality is that there's no beauty in how people are living and there's no space to perceive for themselves you know my favorite concept in art is negative space i talk about it when i'm talking about music as a producer as a composer i love it when people understand negative space my favorite compositions artistically visual art People that, are, that understand negative space are, pe are people that can make designs that move your eye around. They, they're manipulating your, your flow. I think that space is needed for people mm -hmm. to perceive themselves. And the first injustice is black people don't have space to perceive themselves. There's no space to look back. Even when you're shopping in those wide aisles in that spa in Santon, mm -hmm. you can step back and think, what am I having for dinner? Pasta. You can look and make a decision. You know, you go to the shop right that is in Yeovil and that street, and there's no space to walk. There's no space to think. You take a step back. You bump into someone. You take a step forward. You're stepping on a baby. There's no. There's no way to see yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think space. And thinking about art, the fact that for it to be seen as pristine and as good, it's put in a white tube space. And that's a negative space. Mm -hmm. And that's a space where people can step back and, let, and see the work. But this, these are the same spaces that you say alienate. Mm -hmm. And this is why my favorite artists are people that make work accessible and spaces that, that, are, that are kind of pushing that, that question back to communities. You know, One of my favorite artists, I think her name is Taryn Francis. I could be wrong. She's making beautiful work mm -hmm. in Cape Town. She's doing these like passion gap, like funny tapestries going into you know, the history of her people, but also subverting so many narratives. Mm -hmm. And she had a taxi, put these paintings and these installations and these videos in a taxi, and was moving around you know, with the, those Garbdian, like the, the really having a conductor move art around to the community so that people can perceive themselves up close. And she was collapsing that gap between that violent, negative, white tube space and home. But at the same time, when you are talking about the things that you are raising, that children are going home to no parents, mm -hmm. we're living with the violence that, you know, the violence that people are living, you know, it just taking it into their stride on a daily basis in our communities. You, you, the last thing you're thinking about is beauty, but everybody deserves a chance to see themselves as they are. Everybody deserves a chance to have the dignity to decorate their homes. Mm -hmm. Everybody has, everybody deserves a chance to see themselves perceived in art as well. But these are the things that are missing in our communities. And I think, you know, the fact that you are just saying that beauty is not just for the rich mm -hmm. and we, we need to make it almost like a basic need mm -hmm. for people in spaces that, um, firstly, we should, they shouldn't be there. But for that to be a priority, that like, yes, there are basic needs 
um, can we see beauty and art as one of those as well? Mm -hmm. you know, and not look at that as a luxurious or a, a privileged way of looking mm -hmm. at life, because if you, by default, are in a space where you can see yourself, you have space to think, you have space to move, you have space to be, you're already um, you know, living a different quality of life. You know, and everybody deserves that same that same mm -hmm. space. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get ready to sing but to you. But I but you think can, in the same space, perhaps we should, um, you know, give praise to the people who have small little projects. You know, all <coughs> over where with little children, with women. It's because it's not as though there are not people doing that. There are people trying to create those small areas of health, you know, in our communities. And I think that uh, we shouldn't make it their responsibility. They need support, yeah. you know. And it, 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 it has to be our constitutional bodies that were created for that purpose to have us fulfill the Bill of Rights, they should be taken to task for not having those community centers, for not having those areas where people can have, can breathe a non-toxic, in a <coughs> non-toxic environment. Anyway. It's, it's making me think of how one of the reasons why we are inherently so, I don't know, like, not, I wouldn't say spiritual, but I, you know, there's a way that black people fall into spirit and religion, which I think is a reaction to space. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have no space and you have to cultivate an inner world to survive. Yeah. And I don't think that's just, um, obviously there's beyond that, the, the survival mechanism of trying to make space inside of yourself, I think obviously there's an inherent spirituality. But I, I think there's a trauma response as well mm -hmm. to not having space where it's like, you have to think of, black people have to think about, um, you know, the next life, the beyond. They need to think about, it, it sucks right now, we must suffer through this because there's something else. You have no choice because it, it, your situation might not change. You have no space, so you have to cultivate an inner world. Mm -hmm. Whether people are doing it consciously or subconsciously, I thought about this in my art a lot, and I, I see it as an escape, and I see it also as a rescue to be able to go in. Um, and I also wish, think that people should have have different choices to make as well. You know, mm -hmm. this song is always about cultivating an inner world, mm -hmm. but also, you know, we we are you are going to have to think about going in and and being connected to something bigger if your environment is just violent towards you. Um, but I'm also celebrating that, that yeah. ability in, yeah. in people to be able to do that. Yeah. It's almost magic, you know, I think this is what, this is what people are doing every day, mm -hmm. surviving in squalor and living with dignity mm -hmm. and making beautiful things and taking, off that, okay. taking yeah. off that sticker and sticking it on the wall mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. shining that floor, mm -hmm. even though underneath it's cracked and the government is not coming to fix it. Mm -hmm. Before you, you sing, I just want to say one thing which is also very important, which is that um, I think about this all the time, that you know, all the things that we aspire to tend to be things that our society aspires to, are material things. And that, and in fact, at the inception of our government, of our democratic government, what we emphasized was the material things only, you know, the, the, as our aspiration, the schools, the hospitals, the houses, the clinics, you know, etc., etc., etc. but that we did not include the, 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 the values of a society, that we did not include the spiritual values, the non-material things that you cannot touch, but which nonetheless, imagination, you know, that, that appeal and wake up and stimulate your imagination so that you can actually be creative, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... <laughs> 
just thinking about being shouted at for having imaginary friends and yeah. you know my friend Johnny not being encouraged like oh let him yeah. sit down I think Trevor Noah has a joke about that but yeah this song is called Liwa Lentle Zio Excuse me. <laughs> I think maybe, maybe if we, we can, can get, get the mic pressing again, again, it might help. help. Um, is that something that can happen? happen? Yeah. Right. I don't, I don't know, know when I'm going to the next bus stop. Be ready. ready. <laughs> um, no, I don't, don't know have much to say, say after, after that. After I, think that. I, think I think I just wanted, wanted to uh, speak to how, for me, in my music, what has happened is what I was running away from those days in art school when I was told to perform my pain. But, but in, in a way, way that, that I just have accepted that job as a person who, who you know, you know it's, it's like, like if there's an earthquake, earthquake like, like the tremor reaches some, some people first, first, I think it reaches all people first, people react in different ways. My outpouring in a way of kind of moving, moving through the tremor in this art and music and the byproduct of this song, mainly. And, you know, I've just accepted that my calling is to lament when it's sore and to encourage when it's when it's a bit dire. And, and, and so, so art, art and justice is a theme, theme that is, I'm living it in ways that, that, that keep surprising me, you know, the, the irony of, of being, you know, a, a, a law school dropout who loved constitutional law and having an art work in the constitutional courts mm -hmm. collection or the jokes, you know, that I, that I laugh at whoever is holding this together, the source of love, like, oh, you've got quite a sense of humor, don't you? And so I've embraced that this is, you know, these two themes are a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. 
And what I've tried to do, Mom Barbara, which is not easy or successful in many ways, is that I've vowed to open up little courtrooms within my music and within my visual art. Mm -hmm. Because the courtrooms are failing us sometimes out there. Mm -hmm. And so you open an inquiry in a song. You know, and sometimes you open an inquiry in an installation, and I commend arts artists that are doing that. Mm -hmm. And even like, m you know, I'm thinking about Ota mm -hmm. that were making these mm -hmm. these posters, these protests. That was like a direct way of making right. art work for justice. Mm -hmm. And and so many other artists that I'm sure you all know, you are friends with as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredible to just be sitting across the room, you know, from Dato Albi as well. Like, mm -hmm. there's so much in this um, theme, but also in this way of life where. If the if you, if your intersection is art and justice and that's a belief you have, there 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 are so many people for mm -hmm. us to look up to, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. including yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I I I I I tell this often because it's true that um, you know at some point when you looked at artists, you would see that people are trying to get something out and say something with their paintings, but because of the narrowness of their physical life, you know, you, you would always see that picture of the woman with the baby on her back <coughs> and uh, carrying uh, firewood on her head and another child pulling her hand, you know. Uh, and there are millions of those things. And it's not because people are not talented. But it's simply because their lives have been additionally, you know, from being oppressed, they've been additionally, their lives have been narrowed so tremendously that their imagination is, is set out to pasture, you know, I mean, they, they just, they, because they, you have, you can't imagine from nothing. You have to imagine from things that you have heard, that you have read about, that you have seen in film. And it helps when you see a, a movie. If you are 10 years old, you see a, a, a classical movie from India, let's say, of a poor child like you. You immediately feel that you are part of something and not isolated, you know, in, in whatever, you know, fate has been, you know, uh, 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 given to you. Uh, so, yeah, these, uh, uh, art, art, art is so important. And I think that relief, that being able to imagine, it's such a freeing thing in itself. So, so, so that it's, it, it's very important. You know, sometimes when we were debating these things and we talked about having parks in the townships and so people would say, oh, that is such a bourgeois idea, you know. Why do you want green grass and all of that, you know. But these things are proving true. Mm. They're proving true that people are the same. They, they, they have an affinity to nature. And if you go to those townships where there are, the, where there are uh, 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 playgrounds and, and there's green, you know, on weekends, it's, it's heartwarming to see people just going there with their baskets in their neighborhood, enjoying themselves. You know, those are not, uh, and, 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 and you can imagine that those people are surrounded by nature. They're seeing things, they're thinking. We were very lucky in my family that my father was, uh, my father was uh, uh, an artist because we were exposed to art as little children. One of the first words that we learned was design. One of the first English words I learned was about, was design. You know, and I was taught to be observant, you know, because artists are observant, to be aware of my environment and uh, to, to, to participate in my life, not just to be an automaton doing the same thing every, every, every day, 
you know. Uh, so um, to go back here, I'm going to read from um, my book, and I'm, I, she chose the, the, the one that I should read. So I, 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 I grew up in Whitbank with my grandmother, and my grandmother was a Ndebele woman, but we spoke Afrikaans at home. Uh, because my grandfather was white, although he was not there. We, I never saw him. He had died already. But he was a heavy presence in our house because he'd always been absent anyway. Um, <coughs> and um, I didn't know because I never read. I mean, in history, they just told us, I will use the bad words because that's what we read about. They told us about Bushmen and Hottentots wandering around aimlessly in the bush, you know, with their, with their uh, poisoned arrows, you know, um, and the ships that we, we remembered them. To my dying day, I'll remember the dromedaris, you know, and all those three ships, you know. I mean, that's what we learned, and that our people stole, you know, they stole from white people, they stole cattle and, and, and sheep, you know, uh, and, and that, you know, people like to drink and dance and so on. And, um, yeah, so you aspired, of course, you aspired to the other, you know, which was a, a, a and I say in my book, you know, in my white shirt and my gym dress, my black gym dress with box pleats. I didn't aspire towards people, those people in the pictures, in the history books, you know, wandering around aimlessly. I aspired towards the other. <coughs> and so what happened was that we, we pushed away, we pushed away uh, uh, the traditional experience, you know, as it was told to us, and we embraced, you know, um, you know, the, 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 what was more <laughs> superior or what, what, what was portrayed as more superior. Earlier in the book, I tell the story of uh, being a child and listening to my aunt who used to like to go to the bicycle you know, singing a song called Sentimental Journey. But uh, I remember that, that, you know, what was attractive to me were the long words, you know. Um, I'm going to take a sentimental journey, you know. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even know what it meant, but it, you know, it meant something or Chattanooga Choo Choo, you know. We all sang these things we didn't understand Pardon or know me, what boy, they meant. Is that the Chattanooga Choo Choo? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and they used to tease me because my name was Barbara. So they say, hey, Barbaribo. <laughs> <laughs> so all those things. But you know that... Um, because our grandmothers had not had an education and they had had such a hard time, you know, they aspired education for us. They wa it was their aspiration. So we embraced, you know, the education. So my granny had a sister and, and she called her sister Circe. And so we used to call her Oma Sersi. <laughs> so I was raised by these two women. Oma Sersi lived three doors away. And they had, um, when the people were removed from the land, they went to the mining town of Whitbank, which we call Kwakuk. And my granny sold beer, Ujwala. Uh, and, and I admire them now because they didn't want to work in the, in the white households, washing clothes and cooking 
and cleaning. They were independent businesswomen selling African beer to the miners, to the coal miners who were um, uh, uh, who, who were our clients. They would come after work to come and drink, and they would leave at nine o'clock to go back to the compound before the siren rang for them to go back. And um, my grandmothers didn't talk about, they never, never, ever talked about the pain they had undergone as children. It came out involuntarily. <coughs> and each time it came back, they would try to push it back by saying, go and wash the dishes, go and do this. You know, They would stop themselves from talking about the pain that they had endured as children. So here I talk about my two grannies, Oma Cersei and Oma Joanna. <clears throat> my grannies are sisters closed up and bound together in a past that was engulfed in an alien greed for land, for labor, and for overall domination that negated every human aspiration to a life of dignity for Africans. But worse is the story that is untold of female people like them, born into an unforgiving, unforgiving triumphalism, to remain victims of a patriarchy joined to a colonial conquest, unabashedly racist and equally paternalistic to its females. They played the unsung role that guaranteed the emergence of every new generation since the first white man found his feet on African soil. They are the great secret of history and have enjoyed the least attention for their supreme exercise in survival. It is they who have borne the burden of regeneration that has brought us all here. They may not have heard of Sarah Bartman or of Grotowa, Eva van Mierov. Perhaps they heard in passing of Her Majesty Mujaji, the Rain Queen, or of Mantatisi, the warrior queen of Matlogwa. Because all the noise was about Nongawuse, she took center stage in the tales that the white men wrote about unconverted natives. Riddled by a religion that did not practice what it preached, saddled on a horse gone berserk, Women like my grannies rode the beast of, uncert of uncertainty, holding fast to the reins, uncertain how many legs the horse would raise to shake off the rider. From the earliest encounters with the would-be moguls, the spice merchants of Portugal, and on to their arrivals from Batavia, these four mothers of South Africa made their noble contribution to our survival. From those earliest encounters, they were branded by a self-serving religious ethos designed to justify anything that could have been an obstacle in the way of the colonists. Of the colonists. It was the power Held, held by all men, unequal as it was between master and servants, that they withstood and which made it possible for all of us to be here today. That's so beautiful. <laughs> um, wow. I, I'm thinking about how, you know, art can also be used as a tool for that erasure. And for me, personal protest right now is just going back to fetch things that, that, that I should have inherited 
um, an example is that I'm just working on some of my grandfather's songs. He was a choral composer in the rural trans guy, um, or the former trans guy, and he was a, a, a choir master and a teacher, and he would be chronically studying choirs. My father inherited that gift, um, went and became a lawyer, and it it came to me. I never met my grandfather, but I dreamt one of, um, I dreamt a song that felt like something he would have composed, and so I worked on it. But I remember that feeling like justice, you know, that I and at school I, I got there, you know, we, I'm part of a system that is, you know, whitewashing us with art, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's very cunning, it's very thorough. Um, we are we even punished f for expressing yeah. our ourselves as we should. But we are being, the, the erasure, because I'm thinking about Mujaj, I'm thinking about Mush, I'm thinking about Mushresha, actually. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you said that, I was thinking about how, like, it, sometimes erasure comes as gifts. You know, that top hat mm -hmm. and that tailcoat. And that's uh, that's art. That's yeah, essentially a, des a designed yeah. thing. It's, mm -hmm. you're, it's you're being given a gift mm -hmm. that is designed to erase. Mm -hmm. um, and and now, I love the fact that young people are also, you know, understanding that that cultural heritage that we've lost, mm -hmm. it, it that's made us cultural lepers in our own bodies. Mm -hmm. It's like there's justice when we're going to reclaim that thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I'm trying to challenge myself more to obviously not be so hard on myself, but as I learn and unlearn and pick up and go fetch and do as Landa, even the dramatarists you mentioned, I'm thinking <laughs> about how, like, you know, these ships that have gone and, and these shipwrecks that we have, these sites of, of our own erasure and death, if we go back there, art can resurrect those things. Mm. Art goes back and, 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 and raises those stories from the dead and, and art will, it relentlessly do that, even if it's not doing it in the scene world, but it will be done. Mm -hmm. Because I'm inheriting songs that my grandfather didn't teach me, mm -hmm. but they are meant to be mine and they're coming to me. So there's something about leaning into that magic mm -hmm. and, and something about the way you tell your grandmother's stories, mm -hmm. even though you're picking them up from them and they don't want to share them, but you, 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 you caught them. Mm -hmm. And now they're alive in full force because of you. And these stories were meant to be brought forth. An artist doing that, and that is justice to me. Well, the the thing for me also is that art is 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 history. You know, you you don't do it in a vacuum, but uh, <coughs> it 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 is something that encompasses the experience of other human beings at in other places. We uh, just. I think we, it, it, while you're finishing, Mama, if anybody has any yeah, comments, yeah. we're going to open up the floor. Mm -hmm. But please finish your point. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fine. It's, it's, it, it, it's what I wanted to say that, uh, um, yeah, art is history, you know, and if you want to be a, a great artist, uh, you, you take into account the history of other artists, what history of other artists, what they created, so that you don't repeat. But one, one of the things I, I wanted to, to say is that in my, when I went to primary school, in all the schools I went to, because I went to many schools, my father was migrating all over the place, uh, all over the reef, is that there was always a teacher who went beyond the textbook, who would close the textbook and close the door and tell us the history. And they never said, don't tell anybody about this because I'll be fired, etc. But we knew, you know, we knew. And it was those people who built us, you know. And I think that um, my generation, our grandparents, did not want to talk about, the, it was too ugly, you know. How, how do you tell people that you were raped as a child? I'm sure they were raped. All black women were there to be raped, etc. You know, when they were removed from the farms, when they went to the townships and so on to live in the new urban areas, they were the earliest urban, you know. The things that are happening to us were happening to them as well. But I think that your generation has a greater role to play because 
it is relatively liberal now to speak out, you know. You don't have those uh, uh, restraints, you know, on what you say. Uh, and I can, I mean, I mean, when I was a child, nobody ever said sex. As for orgasm, you know, or penis and things like, you never ever said those things, you know. You, you never did. We definitely have and new language. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. We, I mean, I, I remember feeling, I, I remember going through s something that was highlighting the concept of white privilege to me mm. when I was uh, in, in, in high school, and mm. I didn't have the words. But this generation has got words that are very hectic, like yeah. gaslighting Absolutely. and white privilege. Yeah. They know how yeah. to name. Mm. That, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. So, uh, no, I just think that it's, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's our duty not to be like our grandparents, you know, and to be more open and relay, you know, these stories um, to, to, to the younger generation. But at the same time, I sympathize with the young generation because, you know, you have to do a lot of listening. And, and, and sometimes that listening is, is, is um, it's, it's inhibiting. Uh, because it doesn't give you a chance to, 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 to say things as you would want to say them. But I must say that for me, the greatest thing, I mean, today they talk about Ubuntu, but we lived it. <coughs> we lived it. We're very poor. We had nothing. We helped each other. You know, we buried each other, you know. Um, we had no labels, you know, we didn't say, there was no money to save because there were no labels, but you, there, there's so much more in the world. We live in a material world, and South Africa is a supreme example of that, and it's difficult, it's difficult, and I, I, I think that this is where, you know, art comes in again to, to explain some of the things that we we, we, we really, that the things that are not palpable, you know, art explains them, people make that connection. And I, I must refer you to Judge Albi Sex's article. Um, you can find it very easily in, online. Um, uh, it's called 20 Years Later, The Role of Art and Justice in South Africa's democracy. It's a very, very clear uh, explication of not only the experience of history, but the, the experience of art and how it, it, it you know, explains uh, things. Being in the, in the arts and department, uh, culture, arts and culture department of the ANC, we always used to say, Okay, we listen to the speeches, but oh, they're so long, you know, and they go on and on. But when somebody comes on the stage and sings, the message comes out immediately. And we saw it during the anti-apartheid struggle, that artists from all over the world came together and in song helped to free us. Artists from all over the world came together and with their art, they, which used to be in Parliament, I don't know if, well, I don't know if Parliament is still there, but anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it was art, artists played a great <coughs> role in the liberation of, 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 of South Africa. And I'm going to stop now because I'd like to hear some voices. <laughs> Oh man, so any comments? I would love to even hear thoughts on that, on, on what Mama just read as well. And anything to share, please feel free. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, I'm Natasha. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to be one of those annoying people who ask two questions, but I promise they're related. Um, a large part of the Constitution is the simultaneous and corresponding relationship between rights and responsibility. With art being a tool of liberation, as you've just spoken about, what is the ordinary South African citizen's role in society in making art accessible 
when we seemingly have a government that would rather put up a 22 million rand flag than help artists or invest in the arts. And then my second question is, what is the role of art in the education and accessibility of the constitution? I'll start with the last one because I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, one of the things that, that is wonderful about the constitution is that it's not an ANC constitution and it's not a PAC constitution. It doesn't, it belongs to everybody. And I think that what we have missed very much in our country is that we threw out everything, you know. Uh, and when we were in school, for instance, we learned one of our subjects was <coughs> hygiene. Everybody knew hygiene. It was a subject. And you knew about basic cleanliness and how you prevent it, you know, things you could prevent. That agency was, was created within the individual to help themselves. I, I, I don't think that we, we have that... Uh, uh, that civic education, about those things that apply to the quality of life for all of us as citizens of South Africa. Uh, uh, um, we, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me how many people have read the Constitution. You can tell me why it is that... Uh, you know, I don't see copies of it in the nine official languages. I haven't. You know, I've seen the little one, you know. But I really, uh, one of the things I do is wherever I am in a meeting and there's something to be produced, I say it has to come out in more than English and Afrikaans. It has to. And, and, and we say in the Constitution that every, all the languages are equal, but we don't. I can call a meeting of, 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 of us women here and we can discuss about everything in South Africa and agree, but <coughs> the people that we are talking about are not there most of the time. Most of the time they are not there. So, uh, uh, for instance, it is the month of August now. I don't think we have a women's lobby in South Africa. A women's lobby that is non-partisan. That says women as women, we think this should happen in this country. No, we don't. Everything is party political. And I think that really we need to revive our civic our civic associations, because the things that we th that are about service delivery, for instance, which is most of the demonstrations that we have in the, they are all about those things that we want in common, that everybody wants, irrespective of what party they belong to. Now she will answer the first question if you repeat it, because I don't remember it. I I mean I have I have a. A submission, I don't know if it's an answer, maybe a question back to the audience, but just thinking about you know, that the whole idea of what in, what informs community values. You know, mm. gi giving yourself or giving your, your community or your neighborhood or your family a stronger sense of what they know they deserve. You know, because I think you, you're talking about the difference between the, well, the rights and the responsibility and how to instill that, like, mm -hmm. what, what do ordinary South Africans do? What can ordinary South Africans do? And I mean, I'm, you know, almost a, I'm almost a socialist. I believe in so many, co you know, communal ways of mm -hmm. thinking. And I think we need to sacrifice, we need to think about community. We need to think about 
dumbing down the, the high so that everybody's got a better middle life. And I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, do a socialist spiel, but at this, this beautiful community in Ve Venezuela where everybody's working mm -hmm. and there is a playground and they understand that that's a metaphysical war on their bodies if people mm -hmm. are not planting trees. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to inspire, I don't know what does that, I don't know what makes people, gives people a sense of what they deserve, but I'm looking for ways of inspiring that in spaces, you know? And I think maybe art is one of the answers, mm -hmm. but I, I just, I just wish it is one of, it's the, one of the answers. answers. Yeah. I, it's a quick, I also put a sense of what they know they deserve because then we will value the right things. We must know that it's important that there, there are trees in the, in the neighborhood and that there are jungle gyms mm -hmm. and that women can have better choices when they want to give birth. We, the, the, like the, the baseline of what mm -hmm. we're accepting is atrocious because of what we've inherited as well. But yeah, I don't, I don't know if you want to speak back to that or if anybody else wants to, to contribute. Because that's definitely not an answer. Um, so, Nelly Sile Tanjagwayo here. I think I definitely do want to speak on that because that's actually a project that's very important to me. So currently working on a project where we're looking at educating kids about constitutional rights at that level, right? Because oftentimes I think we find um, that we expect to understand rights <laughs> when we're like adults, but no one has actually really taken the time to educate us on rights. You literally go through this entire curriculum then you get to work and then they start telling you things like, oh, there's this thing called human rights, you can't teach people like this, this is how the business is gonna operate, this is what CSI is. Mm -hmm. But we never really fully understand why it is that we need to do those initiatives. You then get to these um, projects where you plug in, you know, whether it's the Nelson Mandela Day, whether it's a project that the company feels is important to them, but you never really truly understand the importance of those projects, the importance of the work that you actually do. And that's exactly what it is like I started pondering about, which is why you know, educating kids about the, like, the human rights at that age became important, mm -hmm. starting the conversation. Having a young one asking their mom and dad, why is it that things operate they operate? Why is the constitution so important? What is the constitution? You know, how do I access the constitution? And I think for me, maybe something you can speak a little bit more to, which is something that, I mean, you've already alluded to that, you know, it's very neglected by our government, is how do you instill that through art? How do we get kids to paint pictures of how the world looks to them and how they'd like the world to be going forward? We talk about them as the future generation, but I don't think we give them a voice until we think it matters, which is a certain age where you're now able to sit at the table. So I think that we need to start having these conversations very early, but just from an artistic perspective, you know, what would you say is probably the best way to just get those conversations going at an early rate? So they start thinking about these things and they start having these conversations and you're not just thrust into this world and then all of a sudden you need to be, you're expected to understand what human rights are and how to sort of like carry yourself in this world that we say is ruled by these human rights. <laughs> Nileti and I are sending each other text messages saying, are you gonna answer or am I gonna answer? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, the work that we do speaks exactly to the question you're raising. And the work, we just had a board meeting today, the Constitutional Trust, and my colleagues are in the room here. And that is precisely the work that we're undertaking. How do we make the Constitution accessible, visible, um, digestible, in all kinds of ways and at every level? From children who watch Takalani Sesame to those who are in grades one and two and three, and we are now developing curriculum for grades eight to I'd 12, like to all based on the Constitution. And then there's a big program that's also ongoing and films being made about um, bringing the language of the Constitution, the values of the Constitution, and the value of the Constitution <laughs> to people in the corporate environment um, and in trade unions and civic society organizations and so on. So. You have to watch our space, but we also want to know <laughs> more details of you and your lady before the end of the evening is going to catch you to get your number. I have <laughs> you do. <laughs> She's captured. Okay. Yeah, that's amazing and inspiring that that's actually happening. I volunteer myself to write an I'm a piano song <laughs> to go with that campaign. <laughs> what have I just done? Mama Barbara, um, I think it's time for us to do our closing remarks. I have nothing to say other than gratitude for your presence today and just hearing your mind and, you know, you're such a poet. I love, I love listening to you speak <laughs> and um, your heart as well. I think your sense of justice is just so deeply rooted. It just, it's coming out of your pores and I'm, 
I feel really um, lucky to have had this time listening to you. And I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the kind remarks. I enjoyed your music. <laughs> I wish we had more time for that, but it means that I have to go and get it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm not going to make any closing remarks. I just <laughs> want to ask Albi Sachs one question because I searched all over. Um, and I noticed that the Americans have, you know, culture and art in their, in their constitutions, as, as do the Germans. Don't you think that there's, ve there's too little said about art and culture in our constitution? I, I, I think that there is very little, and in fact, you have to search for it. I asked her. I said, maybe I haven't read this thing properly. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's no, really nothing I can hold on to here in the Constitution. Thing. Yeah, but it was like a line, you know. <laughs> and, you know, but all the things that deal with political power and, you know, you have reams and reams, you know of information, but when it comes to the thing that knits us together as a society, zilch. Uh, I've often had to defend the Constitution, <laughs> but not against my old comrades. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, Barbara, you went too quickly through the preamble. You saw it as a preamble. It's a very poetic statement in poetic language. It's not technical. Mm -hmm. It's not legalese. Mm -hmm. It deals with pain, aspirations, justice, injustice, belonging. These are the themes you were speaking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sense of an underlying humanity that unites us all, mm -hmm. that enables us to connect and be with each other the, the design, if you like, of the Constitution is a design for space to enable people to do things, to make choices, to express their will, to be different, united in our diversity. Okay, that's not rich uh, to me of any language, mm. but in, in a sense, that's foundational. Uh, that's what you've been saying, and you didn't ask for it, but you're going to get it. You know what was so fabulous about your presentation? You are evergreen. You're evergreen. You're telling us how old you are, and you had a stroke, and you forget things. The words come out beautifully. If you had a little... You must kill a trumpet. No, it's not you must kill. No, you wouldn't blow the trumpet. <laughs> but you're a Barbara Masakela with your voice, with your throat, with your emotion, with your heart. It's just wonderful. As an oldie, I feel so proud. <laughs> I feel so proud. You know, we oldies, we've got something. And we've got something from struggle, from community, from being with others, from exploring. And when you're downtrodden and you're out there, you try harder. You've got to be better. You, you, you've got to be smarter and braver and more imaginative than the enemy, the other side. And the enemy was around us. There were spies. There were people who were suborned. There were torturers. It, it wasn't like an enemy just out there. And the enemy also, the seductions of avoidance and denial... These were the other kinds of enemies. And we had to build a culture of affirmation. I remember the Amandla group coming to Maputo, five nights running. I heard with um, uh, uh, Guangua leading the group, younger people. And again, I felt that tremendous pride. They weren't singing about long live the ANC. They weren't singing a luta continua. They were just being in, in drawing on traditional melodies, choral work, 
with a great sense of affirmation and pride. There was one guy, he had a powerful, I don't, I don't remember his name anymore, a powerful voice. I thought he was six foot six tall because his voice was so powerful and the audience stood up and cheered. And I meet him afterwards and he's this very humble, quiet, almost overcome young African man, thin, much shorter than me. But somehow that voice mm -hmm. and the energy and the ensemble and the courage and the spirit and the alternation of sad and joyous uh, and, and complicated and simple, yeah, this is our future, this is who we are, this, this is our energy. And there wasn't a single slogan there wasn't a single, it's called the Amandla group. And maybe there was an Amandla at the end. But that wasn't what it really was. It was the inside of people mm. and people coming together and all the different languages being used. Uh, that kind of vision of what a South Africa could be up on the stage expressed beautifully through art mm. uh, and, and reaching out to Mozambican people who love music, who love dance, who just felt a pride to be connected, not the poor, suffering, downtrodden people mm -hmm. of South Africa being abused. We must come to their help. But yes, solidarity with our brothers mm -hmm. and sisters. You've got that energy and that spirit. And, and Barbara, you yourself played such a huge role. Uh, you know, I remember when you came to join us and you had two heavy weights against you. The one was your brother, Hugh Masekela. <laughs> and, and it was a port of entry, being the sister of Hugh Masekela. And it was a terrible wait. Because Hugh, he went out there. He was confident. He strutted. But he strutted with, with passion and bravura and, 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 and comfort and total self-esteem. And you were the quiet little sister. Can you imagine Barbara Masekela who stood up to Mandela and taught him all sorts of lessons, quiet. I'm old enough to remember <laughs> quiet, timid Barbara Masekela. And the other is you didn't come in having read Lenin uh, and taking part in the debates about uh, uh, the, the internal colonialism, uh, you know, and all these issues that were important, they were interesting. And you, you were tongue-tied. Can you imagine Barbara Masekela, <laughs> tongue-tied? And to see you as the years passed and you getting a sensibility of how things work and how to be what was called a disciplined comrade, but discipline didn't mean subordinated. It meant fitting in, reaching out, connecting uh, and giving culture a sense of honor and pride in our struggle. Not simply because it was rallying the troops to go out and fight, but because it was affirmative of who we were, of the richness of our people struggling for dignity and rights. And you did it so skillfully, and you helped to create the conditions for speaking to artists and taking artists seriously and not telling artists what to do, trusting artists, but telling artists what they can do that would be connecting up with other artists with the general struggle. Do it in your own way, with your own passion <coughs> and your own style. So Barbara, uh, you didn't ask for this. It's I'm totally, liking. utterly <laughs> unsolicited. <laughs> But I am just so proud and so overjoyed and so happy that other people who weren't around in those days getting a glimpse, getting a glimpse of the vitality of our struggle, our movement, the independence of mind, the spirited people, and that deep, deep, deep sense of humanity. It's in the book. It's in the person that we've heard today. Thank you, Barbara Masakala. <laughs> Thank you, LB. You've done me a huge favor <laughs> <laughs> by extending gratitude to my Barbara and to Msaki, um, following in the footsteps, we imagine, from the deep, 
thoughtful content you shared with us. So two things. We're going to hold you to doing a song for us. Absolutely going to hold you. And um, you would be delighted to know that we have the preamble to the Constitution in 11 languages. And as a gift to each of you, we'd like you to tell the Wando which language you would like the preamble in. And we'll get Albi to sign it tomorrow morning and personalize it to you. And we'll have it delivered to you. Wando, will you assist with that? So thank you very and I'll much. Frame it. And you frame it, absolutely. We can do it in the language of your choice and English if it's your preference. So thank you to everyone in the room and to everyone watching from home and joining us. And we'll make this content oh available on on it's also I think on a link somewhere. We're gonna share it if you want it for people who couldn't be here. And I believe we have one more song to close us out. Thank you. So I have many protest songs, but I'm not going to play one of those now. I'm very inspired by what Judge Albia said, that we just need to affirm ourselves. So I'm going to sing that song that I spoke about, that my grandfather wrote, that I, that I ended up finishing. Mandite Ete Kutala nitule Kuti mandite Te e Kutala nitule Nangu no meva Esula sula Ikondo ya Nabo no meva Besali se Mi punga Oh, when the perfume lay, didum, 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 Kamini constellations spin round your neck. Kala kwa mugubu tonga zange no yiga. Wandini kingo mesi lipela. Zaka lele kanda si kelelo. No chunja na ingo nyama ufana na we dimshadu. Dite mandi kendi zobulela Kutalandi tule Kutimandi te Kutalandi tule Nanguno me Esula sula ikondo ya Nabono me Sali se mi punga ya Oh, mandi perfumle Thank you
Thank you very much. Oh, nobody's moving an inch. <laughs> are you happy to do an encore? Oh, yes, everyone? Yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> okay. But this time you're going to have to I'm dance. <laughs> so make it um, baby. <laughs> okay. Oh, I would love and to see And then afterwards we'll have some food in yeah. the courtyard. Okay, I'm going to sing a song called Ubo Me Abumanga. So I get to you know, this whole uh, understanding that I'm only receiving now in retrospect about some of these songs when they arrive. They're there to kind of help me through that moment, but I've realized that the, the, the love song and the Brutus song is interchangeable, and also that song of lament and that song of joy is interchangeable. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing joy as protest as well. You know, we have, <laughs> we need to have the audacity to, to be joyful, even if we're being, we're living in violent squalor and we have the government perforating us with bullets and they, they, that, that, that other sense of what we deserve and, 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 and even just the, the goal to call for the rights that we are promised comes from that place of being able to have joy in the, in the mess, you know? So I wrote the song dur during lockdown. I didn't know that it was going to be lockdown. It was just before lockdown, in fact. It's called Iboma Abumanga. And any chance that I get to encourage, I try. So here's another, <laughs> another attempt at encouraging myself and others. Beguk talangoko usene mingueno kautu weli plojo usenganeno beguk talangoko. Usena zwinjongo, kautu weli plojo, uzenga neno. Sasi kule sonke, spupe mazulwini. Staka melilanga, staka melilanga, izandi kumbuze, uboma bumanga. A soza be kofana nawe. O fana nawe. Soza be ko. A soza be kofana nawe. O fana nawe. Soza be ko. A soza be kofana nawe. Lizu pumi langa. O fana nawe. Soza be ko. So zabe ko fana na we, o fana na. So zabe ko bula metlu jonge no ba aglulanga daga zivuki le boma bumanga izako no zako nezipi wazako azupele langa boma bumanga. Sizo kanyi sela Ibe mshopi njela Lizu pumilanga Lizu pumilanga Izandi kumbuze Uboma bumanga You guys said you wanted to dance? So zawe kofana nawe Ofana nawe so zaveko, so zaveko fana nawe. O fana nawe, so zaveko, so zaveko fana nawe. Lizo pumi langa, o fana nawe, so zaveko, so zaveko fana nawe. Lizo pumi langa yo mama, o fana nawe. Soza beko. Thank you so much. Soza beko. Chochu beko. Soza beko. Thank you.
Did you get that? Before you just said, please. Yeah. Okay.